Lily Cat is a 1987 Japanese anime, and it's one of those older anime films guaranteed to leave you with more what the fucks than a badly written mockbuster. At the risk of sounding culturally insensitive, this film came out around the time when Japan was far less shy about showing off just how weird it is. Not that they've gotten much better over the years. In addition to being oddly bizarre, both visually and thematically, the movie is also plagued by that classic staple of Japanese animation. CHARACTERS WHO TALK TOO DAMN MUCH! It's too bad they never taught us at the space training camp some way of not putting our foot in our mouth. I just put mine in up to the hip. Forget it, but now that you mention it, there's something we're going to have to be dealing with sometime soon, and that's the quality of the engineers the camp's turning out. With every multinational looking to stake a claim, there's a real shortage of qualified personnel. The captain of the Baikal was telling me they had the same problem. I have to admit, I was wondering why we always seem to end up working with a gang of incompetent amateurs that act like they escaped from a fraternity party. Just keep your blood pressure down, because they're the employees of the mother company, and we're here to assist them on their mission. Don't get bent out of shape. We're interplanetary taxi drivers, and everybody else is just along for the ride. And speaking of which, I think this one's it for me. You're not thinking of retiring, are you? <laughs> yep. As a famous comic book character once said, I'm getting too old for this kind of shit. Probably too late to regret this, but uh, I shouldn't have volunteered for this mission. I must have been crazy or something. If I were on Earth right now, I'd probably be happy, married, and teaching elementary school. Yeah, I was never fairly evaluated by the company, and I never got any of the promotions I put in for. I did my best, but I wasn't getting anywhere. You know? Then the home office announced this mission. They tried to recruit crew members, but nobody was buying it. Some people just have better instincts about this stuff. The pay they were offering was terrific, but it made you really think. How much money would make it worth it to leave your family and friends for so long? My manager recommended me for the very first time. <laughs> Maybe he thought I was the best man for the job because I was spending a lot of lonely weekends. Y you know, putting in extra hours at work. <laughs> well, then I kind of had this crazy dream, you know? I kept thinking, wouldn't it be great if I surprised everybody in the company and volunteered? Now that'd make my stock go up with the office manager. It was an adventure. Of course, given the choice between that and the situation we're in now, I think I would have chosen to remain back on Earth and be despised. What do you think? You a bitch ass nigga. You a bitch nigga. I don't know if it's just the culture or the quality of the language dubs, but one thing that's always bugged me about Japanese anime, both old and new, is how much the characters tend to ramble on and 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 These stories aren't so much a steady sequence of action-based performances set to a narrative, as much as they seem to be an obnoxious series of overblown soliloquies and exposition dumps that drag on for far too long. It's supposed to be animation. NOT A TALK SHOW! And of course, it doesn't help any either that this movie is a pretty damn shameless knockoff. In fact, the way I first came to know about this film was from a YouTube Top 10 listing of alien movie ripoffs. And while the movie is most certainly an alien copycat, it also attempts to rip off John Carpenter's The Thing as well. There's just no shame with this movie, is there? However, I will give the film a smidgen of credit. The movie is very good about setting up a believable air of tension and suspense. So, even though it may be a blatant alien ripoff, at least it's not a bad alien ripoff. And although it borrows quite heavily from John Carpenter's The Thing, it ups the ante a little by introducing a subplot about corporate espionage. Two people on the ship are not who they claim to be. 
casting a shadow of intrigue and danger from a source other than the alien monster. Captain Hamilton, I'm afraid I have some rather unpleasant news to report. It appears that you have two people aboard who are not who they claim to be, nor are they employees of SINCAM. Evidently, they managed to enter the training program at the center with false identification, and then joined the crew on your ship. We've investigated this, of course. I have their names and photos, which I'll put up at end of transmission, but Captain, I must emphasize the grave taint immediately. The rest has been erased, Captain. Unfortunately, about as quickly as they introduced this plot point, they toss it out the window just as fast. Solving the mystery in a manner which is all too... underwhelming. Instead of it being some clever dramatic reveal, the characters more or less just flat out say who they are after an all too convenient expedition dump results in a slip of the tongue. Yeah, but what happened to all of them? Did the bacteria eat them? I don't think we'll ever know that. There are bacteria that'll metabolize on Earth in a short period of time, but no terrestrial aerobic bacteria that I'm aware of can completely dissolve a set of human bones without a trace. Very intriguing. Medical man, eh? It's a hobby. Now that's funny. Something just doesn't seem right. Maybe it's because company data have Mr. Hero Takaji specialized in space engineering and not medicine. I guess they must have gotten things all backwards. <laughs> yeah, now I think I got it. I don't know why I didn't pick it up. You're not an employee of the corporation either now, are you? You're a detective. Huh? All I ever said was that medicine was a hobby. I don't remember saying that I specialized in it. What do you have up your sleeve? The game's done, kid. You shouldn't have said either. Again, this is an action-oriented visual medium, people. It's not freaking talk radio! Another rather glaring flaw I couldn't help but wince at was the film's idea for a main character. A male protagonist who's actually called Hero. Because that's totally original. Of course, the lack of creativity in his name is not what made me wince, but rather the film's expectation that we, the audience, are to sympathize with a character who's a confessed murderer. According to the film's own heavy-handed exposition, he's a guiltless gunman who escaped into deep space to try and evade punishment for his crime. Yet the film plays him off like your typical fresh-faced, sexy, young, virtuous protagonist. Now yes, the film does try to soften the blow by explaining that the men he killed were drug-peddling criminals heading a vulgar prostitution ring who were complicit in his sister's death, but that's still a pretty ballsy move in terms of writing. To only make his actions further questionable, it's never actually stated whether the men he killed were directly responsible for his sister's death, or if they merely facilitated it. If he were avenging her murder, then I'd be more willing to be sympathetic. But if she died due to the inherent dangers of addiction and prostitution, and he murdered them purely out of spiteful vengeance, then maybe not so much. I just can't believe what he was saying about you. You couldn't murder anyone. Appearances can be very misleading. But it's true, I killed three people in broad daylight. What reason could you possibly have had? They made... My sister into a drug addict. But how? She was so beautiful. She used to write me all the time. She left home and enrolled overseas in a big university. Then she just disappeared. I inquired everywhere. No one had any information. When I went to talk to her roommate, she told me she didn't know anything. So when I found her about one year after that, she wasn't anything like she had been. I barely recognized her when I saw her again. And you know where that was, Nancy? Prostituting for a King Street pimp. <gasps> That's terrible! Is she alright? She's dead. <gasps> my brain just clicked off, and I avenged the death of my sister on the men responsible. It's true that drugs have completely contaminated the Earth and the Moon, but you had no right to kill them. We were on their tracks for months, and if we'd only been able to arrest them, we could have split that drug ring, closed down that prostitution operation, and that'd have been the end of them. You bollocked up everything, mate, and cost me my promotion. At best, this makes his character an anti-hero with a sordid past. But it's the way the film tries to paint him that leaves me feeling a tad awkward. 
But then again, maybe I'm just too weighed down by overused bad boy cliches to notice the thematic nuances presented here. I mean, his backstory certainly leaves him feeling more real than most other characters in this movie, and surprisingly less of a cliché of the genre. Then again, he could just as easily be an incredibly charismatic serial killer. The movie just doesn't really present it very well. That's mostly what I'm trying to get across. It also doesn't help when he says stuff like this. If she were alive, she'd be around your age now. Huh? <laughs> Nothing. Very good, Mr. Detective. Your patience has been rewarded. You found the mad gunman who murdered those three men on King Street. I figured I was safe hiding on a starship for 40 years. I never thought you'd be willing to tell me quite this far. Thanks for the confession. What are you doing? We have nowhere to run. We can wait in this block. But that means we'll die of starvation or become another monster like the rest of them. Which doesn't tickle my fancy at this moment in time. So for me, the only answer is for us to kill ourselves. Okay? How about you? What's it gonna be? The chamber's got three shells ready and waiting for us. <gasps> really not doing a good job of not making us think he's a sociopath. And going back to the point of the movie being an obvious alien ripoff with an odd curve toward over-the-top weirdness, the movie drives both points home to a ridiculous degree by not only ripping off the whole renegade android from the first alien film, but here, the synthetic life form is, quote the film, a computerized, animal-shaped, technological robot, a.k.a. cat. Lily Cat? And yeah, the entire ship is literally being controlled by a murderous HAL 9000 robotic cat. Seriously? <sighs> Only in a Japanese film. I just wonder if robotic cats are the only synthetic creatures this company created to pilot their ships. Because with management this screwy, I wouldn't put it past them to have also created a robotic giraffe. Or maybe even a robotic chicken. The only other thing I'd consider to be a major drawback is the phoned-in, hammed-up ending where the last two survivors... Hero and one of the lesser-defined female protags escape in an antique space shuttle as the mothership blows up, Robocat and all, leading to the film ending quite ambiguously as the two nubile young protags land on the alien planet below. The movie just ends off on the assumption that they both landed safely to live happily ever after on an alien world with no way to return home or contact Earth completely ignoring the fact that earlier in the film, they stated that the planet was unexplored and very likely uninhabited. I'm the careful type. There might be aliens, kid. There might be, mate, but since our number crunches indicate planet LA-003 was created about four and a half billion years back and is currently going through a sort of Cambrian-era geological state, I somewhat doubt you'll find anything bigger than a <laughs> flea. Guess I'll have to shoot low. Despite the way the movie tries to play it, this is a crappy way to end the film, because we, the audience, don't know whether they're flying to safety or certain death. We don't even know whether the alien bacteria which infected the ship was also present on the planet. They could literally be flying out of the frying pan and into the fire. But the movie just plays it off like it's a good old happy ending without even offering a nod to these concepts. This is not how you end a sci-fi horror flick! They should have at least ended with the appropriate tone of apprehension and uncertainty, instead of leaving off on the assumption that it's a happy ending just because they escaped the ship, as this blatantly ignores all priorly stated variables that cast a shadow over the expected longevity of the surviving protagonists. I was wondering about butterflies and if they ever regretted that, if they ever even thought of their past as caterpillars. And if the caterpillar ever thinks of its future up there as that exquisite creature in the air, we'll be metamorphosing somewhere onto another level someday. 
Some other kind or frequency of existence, if that's our promised end. We'll have to live out whatever our destiny is. And nobody can know what the future will bring in this world or even the next one. What the f*** is wrong with you? You f***ed up mother bastard! What the f***? Now, for all these movie's failings, I will grant it a couple of tiny points of credit for the inclusion of two plot points that I consider to be fairly creative and would love to actually see utilized more in the sci-fi genre. The funny irony of science fiction is that there's usually a staggering lack of science to balance out the fiction. One point that this movie brings up is how traveling through space opens up a whole new perception on the concept of time, and just how relative that subject truly is. To put it simply, for those who didn't grow up watching Bill Nye, the passage of time differs greatly from planet to planet. A year on Mercury is not the same as a year on Pluto. <laughs> not even close. Because a year is measured by how long it takes a planet to make a single trip around the sun. And this passage of time becomes even more convoluted when we talk about traversing the vast inky blackness between the stars. For example, in the time it would take a person to travel from Earth to Mars, roughly about a year would pass on Earth. Give or take several highly technical details. For another example, in the time it would take to travel from the Earth to Pluto, almost an entire decade would pass here on Earth. This means that even with the hypothetical advent of cryogenic technology to keep you from dying of old age, you would still essentially be forced to give up your old life on Earth. So any family or friends you had before departure would very likely be long dead, or really, really old, by the time you got back. This movie toys with that fact by giving us two characters who are well over a century old. Two centuries in the case of the captain. You're far too young. What do you mean I'm too young? I've got to be the same age as you, Captain. You think so? How old am I then? Uh... How about her? I just passed 240. Carolyn's 150 years old, right? I'm 151. Huh? <sighs> as well as introducing us to the idea of criminals hopping into deep space to try and escape their crimes back on Earth. Both incredibly interesting concepts that I'm genuinely surprised more sci-fi entries have not tried to explore more often. I know a lot of sci-fi films and shows try and get around the hurdle of the centuries-long journey by introducing light speed into the story, but it still makes for pretty weak world-building. Especially when you have franchises like Star Wars that introduce lore-specific dates and time gaps between films that call into question what reference of time they're using to measure that. Like seriously, between Revenge of the Sith and A New Hope, we're told that 30 years has supposedly passed. But on whose planet? You can't have a story that spans multiple planets, tell me that a certain amount of time has passed, but ignore the fact that a day or year on one of those planets is very likely different from all the rest. But then again, George Lucas didn't even know what a parsec was, so I can hardly expect him to take space-time relativity into account now, can I? So, to wrap it all up, it was an alright movie, with a few interesting twists and turns, but by the end, it just falls flat on its face. In its attempt to rip off far better movies like Alien, The Thing, and Space Odyssey, it fails to capture the lasting appeal of either, and is mostly just a forgettable experience all around. But seriously though, if you want to watch a sci-fi movie about an alien creature killing people on an oversized spaceship, just watch Alien. Again. Hello, my baby. 
Hello, my honey. Hello, my ragtime gal. Send me a kiss by wire. Baby, my heart's on fire. If you refuse me, honey, you lose me. Then you'll be left alone. Oh, baby, telephone and tell me I'm your own. Check, please.